welcome to this CNUE conference on the implementation of the European Directive on Cross-Border Transformation, Mergers and Divisions. Uh, my name is Guillaume Casanova. I'm the Communications and Event Officer of the CNUE. And uh, before I turn the floor over to our speakers, um, I will give you a few technical information about the conference. First of all, please note that we have interpretation available in French and English. You can select the language by clicking on the globe at the bottom of your screen. Our conference will be divided into two panels. At the end of each panel, participants will have the opportunity to ask questions to the panelists. To do this, please ask your questions in the chat window, and we will select several of them. But um, before we dive into today's topic, uh, we have the pleasure of welcoming online Gianpaolo Marco, notary in Aosta and president of the CNUI for the year 2022. And Mr. Marco will deliver the opening speech. Presidente Marco, a lei la parola. Grazie. Merci à tout le monde. J'espère que vous m'entendez. Je veux souhaiter au présent mes salutations et la bienvenue à tous les présents qui, dans cet après-midi, pour vous souhaiter un bon travail. Cette conférence sur la mise en œuvre de la directive européenne sur les transformations, les fusions et les scissions transfrontalières est vraiment très importante pour le CNUE et pour le notariat européen. Elle a été organisée dans un moment très délicat, très important. La directive a été adoptée le 27 novembre 2019. Les États membres ont les 36 mois jusqu'à 31 janvier 2023 pour transposer dans leur droit national la directive. Et je pense que cette directive soit très importante parce qu'elle renforce l'esprit européen. Elle facilite et réglemente d'une matière de plus en plus organique les profils d'interconnexion entre les entreprises. Elle va créer de plus en plus un espace économique européen préparatoire à toute intervention politique. Nous vivons au moment européen, il vient de dire la présidence française de l'Union européenne. Le CNUE a déjà accueilli en faveur cette directive en déclarant qu'elle permet aux sociétés européennes de se fusionner, de chaîner, de transférer plus facilement leur siège à l'intérieur de l'Union européenne. Mais on a toujours marqué le fait que c'est nécessaire un fort contrôle. Les opérations ne doivent pas être artificielles ou abusives, et les intérêts des parties prenantes doivent être suffisamment protégés. C'est pour ça que le rôle du notaire, c'est très important. Et nous devons souligner le rôle du notaire pour garantir la sécurité juridique et prévenir les abus en droit de société. On a un système de société dans lequel les notaires font un contrôle juridique très fort préventif tout au long du cycle de la vie de la société. Ils vont garantir que les sociétés sont effectivement créées, que leurs statuts sont adaptés aux besoins et aux demandes spécifiques des fondateurs et que les changements structurels ultérieurs au cours du cycle sont juridiquement valables. L'identification fiable des associés et des administrateurs par le notaire permet aux entreprises aussi et aux autorités gouvernatives que de déterminer d'une manière efficace et fiable qui se trouve derrière une entreprise et qui peut la représenter. C'est pour ça que, aussi dans la matière de directive, les notaires doivent jouer un rôle très important. Je pense en particulier au thème de certificat préalable, aux opérations, à leur transmission et au contrôle de l'égalité de l'opération transfrontalière et notamment au contrôle anti-abus prévu par la directive. En effet, la directive nous fournit un cadre général pour la procédure avec des aspects spécifiques qui doivent être respectés pour faire en sorte que les procédures soient suffisamment harmonisées et pour garantir la sécurité juridique, tout en laissant aux États la possibilité d'adapter leurs systèmes nationaux. Et c'est dans cette adaptation que le rôle du notaire doit être mis en premier étage par les politiciens. Je vais introduire, je vais donner la parole au professeur qui va introduire et va diriger la première table. Elle est conseillère à l'académie chez Latman et Watkins. Elle est spécialisée en droit commercial et en particulier en restructuration des entreprises et en droit de l'insolvibilité. Et c'est à vous de continuer les travaux. 
Bon travail à tout le monde et bon après-midi. Merci. Uh, firstly, allow me introduce myself. Uh, my name is uh, Juana Pulgar. I am professor in business law at the University Complutense of Madrid. And uh, currently, I am also the president of a special group set up within the Spanish General Codification Commission established by the Ministry of Justice in June 2020 in relation to the implementation of the European Directive on Cross-Border Mobility. Uh, I apologize for the use of the mask, but uh, currently I am in my office and uh, here it is mandatory to wear the mask at all times. I hope you can hear me uh, more or less. <laughs> Um, I would like to express my gratitude to the notaries of Europe for giving me the chance to participate in this conference on the topic of the Directive on Cross-Border Mobility and Company Law. Uh, it is also a pleasure and an honor to chair this round table on the scope of the Directive on Cross-Border uh, Mobility. Uh, let me introduce very briefly the speakers in this round table. By the way, apologize if I don't pronounce your names and family names in the correct way. Uh, the speakers in this round table are King Carnival, notary in Brussels, Jan Kruta, notary in Prague, Celine Schwartz, she's notary in Toulouse, and she's also a member of the CNUE Company Law Working Group. Thank you for accepting participate in this round table. As everybody knows, uh, the key issues around the transposition of the directive for cross-border mobility into the member states are on the one hand, the scope of the directive, I mean, companies and modalities of mobility. And on the other hand, the controls surrounding the issuance of the pre-operation certificate, and in particular, the problems raised by the new anti-abuse controls. The topic of this first round table is precisely the scope of the directive. In my performance uh, as a chair of this round table, I would like to suggest, if I may, uh, deal, with, deal with through a dynamic approach. Uh, the idea is to ask uh, four key questions, at least four key questions to the speakers on the topic of the scope of the directive on cross-border mobility and give them the floor to answer the questions. Uh, in any case, uh, please let me know uh, if you have other suggestions so as to make the debate more interesting. Uh, I will give the floor to the speakers in the following order. King Carnival, Jan Kruta, Celine Schwartz. And uh, the first question I would like to ask uh, to the speakers is, do member states intend to broaden the scope of application of the directive on cross-border mobility supplementary for partnerships or the implementation of the directive must be focused on limited liability companies only given the complexity of cross-border conversions mergers and division and the multitude of the interest concern above all the creditors' interest. The floor is yours, King Carnival. Feel free to start when you want. Thank you very much. Um, well, um, I thought that, uh, well, thank you much for your question. And I thought that it would be a good idea to give you um, um, a small overview of the way in which we can organize uh, cross-border um, mobility here uh, in uh, Belgium. The first thing that I, uh, or firstly to ask or to answer to your question is uh, that I do not have any knowledge of the fact that Belgium is planning to broaden the scope of the uh, EU directive to, to partnerships. It is open for all limited liability companies in any case in Belgium. And that is the case since the 1st of May, 2019, which is exactly the day on which a new Belgian, uh, a new code of companies and association came into and associations came into force in uh, in Belgium. 
And the fact is that our new code goes a lot further than what is foreseen in the directives that organize cross-border mobility between EU member states. And that's why I wanted to give you a brief overview of the things that we already can do and that we already can do since quite a long time, um, more specifically since uh, 2008. So firstly, we can organize cross-border mergers, which is an implementation of the Directive 2005-56, where um, cross-border mergers can be done in Belgium since uh, 2008. Now, I think that that's something that is uh, common um, and uh, that is uh, well known by uh, all member states, of course. Then, um, and that's something where we are a bit avant-gardist, I uh, shall say, we can organize full and partial the mergers between um, existing and new companies. So existing and new companies, that's the point where we go further than um, the uh, directive foresees. And that's something that we can do since the 1st of May, 2019. Um, we can also organize in a cross-border way transfers where consideration is given in shares and contributions where consideration is given in cash. So that can be done in a cross-border way since the 1st of May 2019. And then, of course, we can organize cross-border conversions, which is legally fully possible since um, May 2019. And that's something that we already did before uh, 2019, but that's um, uh, something where we based ourselves on um, judgment of the EU Court of Justice, where we distributively um, um, uh, um, applied the legislation that was, for instance, applicable in Belgium, the Netherlands and Luxembourg, etc. Et so we actually know that the Belgian legislator has been very fast and very liberal, liberal for cross-border conversions, uh, conversions and, and, and demergers, which are, as, already, as I already said, open for all limited liability companies as foreseen by um, our code. And more important, perhaps more importantly, or another important thing is that it is open for EU and non-EU transactions. So that's also an important point uh, to point out. Um, that all uh, perhaps because of the fact that the Belgian Minister of Justice in 2019 was a corporate law professor, as, uh, as you are, <laughs> so he knew what we needed. Um, so um, uh, in a conclusion to your question, I can say that we as Belgian law pr 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 uh, practitioners feel that the scope of the Belgian legislation is broad enough and we do not really feel the need to broaden up the scope of the Belgian national law to partnerships, for instance. Okay, thank you so much, Tim. Uh, Jan Kruta, the floor is yours. Thank you, good afternoon. Uh, let me introduce very briefly uh, legal background in the Czech Republic. Uh, the rules that are uh, laid down by the directive on the, uh, on the cross-border measures uh, are applied in the Czech Republic not only for uh, not only to uh, cross-border mergers, but also to demergers, uh, divisions, uh, and uh, other similar transactions. So uh, the Czech law uh, complies in many aspects with the new directive. Uh, we expect uh, some minor changes in particular with regards to rights of uh, creditors, rights of employees and uh, rights of the members of companies. Uh, and similar rules uh, apply to all business companies in Czech Republic, not only to um, private limited companies and joint stock companies, but also to uh, limited partnership and unlimited partnership. Uh, I mean, I mean uh, uh, these two legal forms are well known uh, from German law as Offenhandelsgesellschaft und Kommanditgesellschaft. Uh, and I'd like to emphasize the 
specific role of Czech notaries in the field of mergers and uh, similar operations, because uh, in the Czech Republic, notaries are the only authority who uh, issue pre-merger certificates and similar certificates, and who uh, scrutiny legality of the operations. And notaries also register mergers and similar operation in the commercial register, directly, independently, without any intervention or supervision of competent courts. Okay, thank you very much. It is a very different uh, approach to my question. And uh, I would like to know the, the approach of Celine Schwartz related to the French uh, system. The floor is yours, Celine. Bonjour à tous. Euh, donc, euh, en France, la transposition n'est pas encore vraiment en route, puisque, comme vous le savez, nous sommes en année électorale, avec euh, une session parlementaire qui se finit dans les jours qui viennent euh, et des élections présidentielles en avril et du Parlement en juin. Euh, et euh, dans le cadre des discussions, euh, ce n'est pas tellement le champ d'application qui a été discuté, mais plutôt ce qui sera abordé euh, dans le, la deuxième table ronde sur le contrôle de l'égalité. Euh, il faut remarquer qu'en France, quand il y a eu la transposition de la directive de 2005, il n'y a pas eu de surtransposition, c'est-à-dire qu'on est resté euh, circonscrit au cadre de la directive. Et donc, euh, les sociétés concernées euh, en France sont de quatre ordres, euh, donc les sociétés anonymes, euh, les sociétés par action simplifiée, qui sont de plus en plus euh, répandues, et également donc, les sociétés en commandite par action, qui sont pas très répandu et les sociétés à responsabilité limitée qu'on appelle chez nous donc les, les SARL euh, qui sont listées dans notre code de commerce. Euh, donc, les sociétés exclues euh, dans notre droit positif euh, pour ce genre d'opération sont les sociétés en commandite simple. Euh, les SNC et les autres types, euh, également les entités par exemple, sans personnalité morale ou les groupements d'intérêts économiques, donc les GIE. Euh, pour lesquelles euh, des, des opérations transfrontalières restent possibles, mais euh, pas dans le cadre de la transposition de la directive, donc euh, en utilisant la, la technique du conflit de loi. Euh, la seule euh, position sur euh, cet élargissement euh, de la directive sur le champ d'application, elle est de la Chambre de commerce et d'industrie de Paris euh, qui concentre quand même beaucoup de cas de mobilité euh, transfrontalière euh, et qui, elle, considère qu'il ne faut pas forcément euh, élargir, euh, d'autant plus que les sociétés qui ne sont pour l'instant pas concernées, qui sont la société en nom collectif et euh, la société en commandite simple, sont quand même très peu utilisées. Euh, pour les gros groupes, on va surtout retrouver des sociétés anonymes hein, et ensuite des sociétés par euh, action simplifiée euh, qui présentent l'avantage d'avoir une grosse liberté euh, dans la rédaction des statuts. OK. Thank you, Salim. Uh, well, uh, related to the Spanish model, uh, I can say that uh, already uh, in Spain, we don't understand the scope of the application of the previous directive on cross-border mergers to partnerships. Um, in our point of view, well, probably it entails uh, an especial risk uh, for creditors. And um, in our special working group uh, for the transposition of the directive on cross-border mobility, um, we, we don't foresee to include a partnership. Uh, as far as I know, in Italy, Uh, the situation currently is more or less like in Spain. Uh, as far as I know already in Italy, uh, only extend the scope of the application of the previous directive on cross-border mergers. Um, they extend the, the scope of this directive to partnerships. And I would like to give the floor to Conrado Malberti because it is a um, different approach uh, uh, from Uh, the model that we, we have in Spain. The floor is yours, Corrado. Thank you very much, Juana. Uh, although I'm not uh, particip participating in this panel, 
In fact, the, the Italian approach is really broad and uh, uh, it includes, uh, for example, uh, uh, partnership. I mean, I'm still making reference to the uh, situation we have now with the cross-border uh, mergers. Um, and uh, uh, it also, uh, to some extent, uh, addresses the uh, difficulties uh, you may face when you're dealing with a cross-border mergers with the companies operating non in the EU. In fact, uh, the legislation is limited uh, to the uh, mergers uh, occurring uh, between Italian companies and EU companies, but there is uh, a rule which uh, to some extent uh, doesn't directly extend, but opens the possibility also of applying uh, uh, mutatis mutandis, the rules that you have in our legislative decree for cross-border mergers also to operations uh, that take place uh, with companies uh, uh, operating outside uh, uh, the European Union. And also our private international law is really open toward this type of transactions. So uh, essentially, even before the transposition of the directive on cross-border mergers, it was possible to uh, it was possible to uh, have uh, cross border mergers, cross border conversions, and also cross border divisions. The main problem we had was that uh, um, we didn't have a set of uh, detailed rules to carry out these transactions uh, with companies uh, uh, coming uh, not only from the European Union but also from outside the European Union. And this was the main practical difficulty, which to some extent still exists today, because as I told you, the legislative decree is mainly concerned with, the, is essentially concerned also for, I would say, some procedural rules concerning the way it was adopted by our parliament. Um, it is mainly concerned with the mergers occurring within the European Union, but uh, many of the principles may be applied also many of the principles you find in this legislative uh, decree in this piece of legislation may also be applied for uh, operations of taking place with companies outside of the European Union. Okay, thank you, Gobrado. Okay, um, we go ahead. The second question um, I would like to ask is uh, regarding uh, the future implementation of cross-border divisions Tim has already mentioned something about this question, but uh, I would like to know exactly, uh, uh, as, you, as we all know, the explanatory memorandum of the directive in its point or recital eight states that the directive uh, lays down rules on cross-border divisions, both uh, partial and full divisions, but only related to those divisions involving the formation of new companies. And uh, do the speakers understand possible extent in the implementation of the directive, the new legal regime also for cross-border divisions when the beneficiary company is in the, in the other member state already exist? I mean, divisions for absorption. Tim, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, well, as you already mentioned, I think that I can refer to um, yes. my first uh, answer. Yes. <laughs> um, so, uh, but no, but I, I want to briefly comment on, on, on this because um, um, the thing is that, in, that uh, so as I already said, in, in the Belgian uh, national law broadens um, the, um, the playing field of the directive, eh? being that we can organize partial and full D mergers um, or divisions uh, to, um, to uh, existing companies. And um, I find it a bit of pity that the directive did not foresee um, the possibility to organize the mergers to, um, to existing companies, because in my experience here in Belgium for classic uh, uh, national uh, demergers, I think that eight out of 10 the mergers are being done with between two existing companies. So I'm a bit curious to know uh, what um, what other 
panelists uh, think about that because we do not really do a lot of um, um, partial, partial or a full demergers to new codes. In, in eight out of 10 uh, or in 80% of the time, we uh, organize that to, um, to already existing companies. Okay, thank you, Tim. Uh, Jan, the floor is yours. I absolutely agree with Tim. It's uh, in the Czech Republic, the situation is very similar. Uh, divisions, the divisions are allowed where uh, an existing company, uh, when when some assets are uh, transferred to an existing company or 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 to more more existing companies, and this is more frequent than uh, divisions with new companies, and. Uh, I suppose that this will stay untouched in the Czech Republic and will not be a subject of change. So this type of division is allowed in the Czech Republic and probably will be allowed in the future. Okay. Okay. Uh, Selin? Oui, alors en France, il n'y a pas de disposition spécifique à ce jour sur les scissions transfrontalières. Donc, on en revient à la règle de l'unanimité, puisqu'il y a changement de nationalité de la société. Et effectivement, en droit interne, en revanche, ce sont les scissions au profit d'entreprises préexistantes qui sont les plus fréquentes. Et la parade qui est souvent trouvée à ce jour, c'est de faire une scission en droit interne et après d'effectuer une fusion transfrontalière ou un transfert de siège. On se débrouille comme on peut. Euh, donc euh, voilà, alors après, je ne sais pas comment ça va être transposé, puisque à ce jour, on n'a pas de réglementation sur les scissions transfrontalières. Est-ce qu'on gardera euh, la restriction euh, du préambule de la directive ou pas euh, Mais en tout cas, sinon, il restera toujours euh, la parade de la scission préalable euh, en droit national. Yeah, I agree, Selim, because the, the directive is uh, so clear. No? In Article 116, number three, defines the recipient companies as being exclusively companies newly formed during the cross-border division. Uh, well, in Spain, in our working group, we are considering whether uh, to include the division for absorption in our national regime or not. The decision has not been taken yet, but um, well, it is interesting to hear the experience in other, in other systems. Um, Corrado, would you like to, to add something? Uh, yes, with pleasure. Also because it is a, a delicate uh, topic uh, also in Italy. And uh, I find it interesting that uh, in Spain, uh, we are uh, still, uh, I would say, and waiting uh, to take a final decision. Yeah. I think uh, that uh, the Italian approach will be again uh, quite liberal on this point, because uh, uh, I mean, how does it work uh, the implementation of the directive uh, in Italy? Essentially the parliament uh, uh, adopts a, a law which uh, gives uh, guidelines to the government uh, in the transposition of the directive. And currently, uh, the parliament is discussing uh, this law. And uh, if I'm correct, this law includes the possibility of having uh, these divisions uh, into pre existing companies, um, um, which uh, again is, uh, as Tim was saying, uh, something that is uh, uh, occurring quite frequently in the practice. I would say the vast majority of uh, divisions that uh, uh, I see from uh, a professional uh, perspective uh, uh, are divisions uh, into pre-existing uh, uh, companies. And frankly speaking, also when uh, the directive was negotiated, I was a little surprised about uh, the fact that it didn't include that. But uh, I've been told that uh, there was a reason 
uh, to that decision at the European level, because for some member states, it was particularly intricate to um, allow this type of transactions. And for this reason, it was considered less, uh, I would say, difficult to have the directive approved without having this option. And uh, the idea was to leave that possibility to the member states to decide if they wanted that. This is my understanding, but again, I didn't really take part in the, in the preparatory works of the directive. Yeah, thank you. Well, I'm not sure if the directive allows that possibility really, because if you analyze the explanatory memorandum of the directive in its uh, point eight, uh, let's say, states that the directive lays down rules on cross-border divisions, both partial and full divisions, but only, they say, only related to those divisions involving the formation of new companies. And also, uh, as we have already mentioned uh, in the uh, Article 116. But, um, well, I agree with you, probably uh, the, the member states uh, have um, the option to 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 broaden the, the scope of the directive. Well, we, as I have already mentioned in our group, we we are considering whether to include the division for absorption in our national regime or not. The decision has not been taken yet, and then um, well, we will discuss on that on this topic. The third, the third question is very interesting. And is um, should the member states use the opt-out clauses containing the directive to exclude the application of the new regime of cross-border conversions, mergers, and acquisitions to companies which are the subject of, on the one hand, insolvency proceedings, and on the other, on the other hand, liquidations proceedings. Tim, the floor is yours, and uh, we are looking forward to to hear you. Thank you very much, Juana. Um, now, um, I'll first talk about uh, the insolvency proceedings, and then secondly um, about the liquidation um, uh, proceedings. Um, so for what concerns the insolvency proceedings, I find it in any case quite difficult to, un to organize cross-border transactions between um, or where, amongst others, a company um, um, is subject to an insolvency um, uh, procedure. I give you some examples of the way the Belgian um, system works and, um, well, um, more specifically, organizes a creditor um, protection and in that case makes um, um, cross-border transactions um, between companies uh, in a uh, insolvability proceedings or proceeding difficult. So the Belgian uh, legislation that organizes, for instance, the cross-border conversions foresees that creditors can ask for a guarantee for the outstanding debts of the company within a period of two months, starting as from the moment that the cross-border proposal has been pub published in the Belgian official state gazette. So this technically means that a cross-border conversion might be possible, but in reality, extremely difficult to organize. So we can do it, but um, um, uh, practically, it will be quite difficult to understand it. So, and why is that? Well, more practically, a Belgian notary cannot pass um, a deed concerning a general assembly organizing an outbound uh, cross-border conversion, uh, nor a merger, by the way, um, if the company has not taken measures toward, toward its creditors, so being reimbursement of debt or organization of the guarantees. And I understand I'm not a specialist in insolvency procedure, of course, but if a company is under an insolvency procedure, the main thing is, of course, that some cred creditors will, will have to wait to be reimbursed or the, the debts will be um, reorganized, etc. So I find that difficult to see those two things together with our uh, procedure. And actually, the same things goes for our uh, outbound cross-border divisions and mergers. 
there, um, the Belgian notary cannot deliver a pre-merger certificate, which allows, of course, the other state to go on with uh, the transaction when the creditors that are opposed to the cross-border demerger have not been reimbursed or when they were not given a, given a guarantee established uh, by um, uh, the company. So my conclusion here is that de facto cross-border mobility will be a very difficult point given the protection that is foreseen in favor of creditors. And then uh, briefly on the liquidation procedures, I checked the Belgian law there, and it is, according to Belgian law, impossible to organize cross-border mergers with a company that has been put into liquidation. And that is simply said, stated like that by the Belgian Code of Companies and Associations. There is no specific Belgian rule that prohibits companies in liquidation to take part to a cross-border merger or conversion. Um, and um, I think it is in any case um, impossible to organize a cross-border transaction merger, demerger, conversion with a company that has put uh, that has been put into, liquida into liquidation and that, that has already started distributing its, its assets to its shareholders. Um, and that's simply based on the wording of the directive. Then the limit related to the uh, liquidation uh, is when the distribution of assets has begun. Okay. Thank you, team. Uh, Jan, the floor is yours. Thank you. In the Czech Republic, there are no special rules for companies in insolvency or companies in liquidation. Uh, and the only exception is the liquidation where the, uh, where the distribution of assets has already begun. As I know, there is no discussion on this topic in the Czech Republic. Uh, nevertheless, uh, such operations uh, are very, very rare. Uh, even not possible in many cases. And obviously they are always connected with a higher, higher risk of abuse or illegality. So but it, 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 are, yeah. In general, there, such transactions are allowed, but very, very rare. And unusual. No, but well, the question is: Is it possible an abuse under an insolvency judicial proceeding? Uh, for instance, well, from my point of view, I I, I understand that sometimes uh, cross-border mergers or divisions uh, might be a very important restructuring tool, and um, as a part of an agreement a judicial insolvency agreement, it can be useful, no? Uh, maybe, maybe uh, the key question is uh, one fix all, or we must distinguish situations in, in which the company under a judicial insolvency proceeding is the acquiring company or the company being acquired. Maybe uh, we can distinguish uh, different situations, no? Uh, I don't know, what do you think? Yes, yes, I agree, but uh, uh, as I know, uh, mergers and other, uh, and other similar operation, uh, are not used even uh, in domestic uh, transaction. Even the domestic transaction are not used uh, in for the bankrupted companies. And I doubt that it will be uh, very frequent uh, for the cross-border managers and cross-border transactions. Okay. Celine, the floor is yours. 
Oui, alors je voudrais d'abord rappeler qu'en droit français, l'insolvabilité, euh, elle se définit par l'incapacité à pouvoir rembourser ses créanciers. Euh, donc, on a plusieurs procédures euh, de gravité euh, différentes. Donc, on commence par la sauvegarde avec euh, sauvegarde accélérée, sauvegarde financière accélérée, redressement judiciaire jusqu'à la liquidation judiciaire. Euh, on n'a pas de disposition à ce jour spécifique pour euh, les opérations transfrontalières, mais euh, en me référant aux opérations de rente interne en fusion, on a un système euh, enfin, qu'on appelle exempté de protection des créanciers, euh, c'est-à-dire que chez nous, les créanciers peuvent former opposition à la fusion euh, donc devant le tribunal de commerce compétent avant l'opération de fusion. Et donc là, il va y avoir plusieurs possibilités. Euh, soit le tribunal de commerce va rejeter l'opposition parce qu'il ne la considère pas valable, soit euh, il va ordonner le remboursement des créances, soit il va demander la constitution de garantie supplémentaire, si c'est encore possible. Alors, voyant ce système qui prévaut chez nous euh, d'opposition préalable, je ne vois pas trop comment euh, on pourrait envisager des opérations pour des sociétés qui seraient vraiment en situation d'insolvabilité, puisque euh, l'une des solutions, c'est le remboursement des créances ou la constitution de garantie. Euh, alors ça, c'est pour les sociétés qui seraient, par exemple, enfin euh, c'est plus une, pro, une réponse pragmatique, mais euh, pour les sociétés qui, pour le coup, seraient en liquidation judiciaire, euh, le principe, c'est la perte de la personnalité morale, sauf pour la continuation des opérations de liquidation, c'est-à-dire que la société peut garder sa capacité sauf seulement pour les opérations de liquidation. Elle n'a pas le droit de faire d'autres opérations, par exemple, elle ne peut pas modifier l'objet, elle ne peut pas joindre d'activité. Donc, voilà, une opération de mobilité transfrontalière, je ne suis pas sûre que ça rentre dans le cadre des opérations permises pour une société en liquidation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Celine. It is a, a very important question. I don't know if Colorado would like to take the floor and explain the situation in Italy. Sorry, thank you very much. I, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can. We can hear you. Yeah, because I, I apologize. I have seen in the chat someone ask me is if I if I can take out my mask when I uh, when I speak, but uh, I apologize. Uh, I can take out my mask when I speak because I am uh, currently I'm in my office in a um, public space and uh, it is mandatory to wear the mask covering my nose and mouth at all times. And uh, I'm so sorry, uh, probably <laughs> it would be better if I stay in my house but I need to work and uh, I am at the office and I'm so sorry, but uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, I don't know if as well as if I can, if I take out my mask, but I can, I'm so sorry. Anna, we can hear you and uh, we all need to work to some extent. <laughs> so, <laughs> and we don't want you to violate any rule. Uh, <laughs> It may result in fines. No, no, but COVID is a crazy situation, you know, because uh, <laughs> yes. we, we have, all, all of us, we have the vaccination, uh, the booster, everything. But uh, in Spain, at least until now, uh, mask is uh, still mandatory uh, in the offices, in the, at, the, at the university. Look, oh, for solidarity, I will wear it too. Thank you very but much. <laughs> Anyway, to, 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 to answer your question regarding uh, insolvency uh, uh, law in Italy, this is really an intricate question. First of all, because I'm not an insolvency lawyer. And um, as uh, uh, it was said before uh, by Jan and uh, also, if I remember well, by Tim, uh, these uh, transactions from, uh, I would say, talking more uh, as a notary, they are not, uh, uh, I would say, quite frequent. And when they occur, uh, they are really unique. They're really exceptional. Um, so the vast majority of cross-border mobility transactions that we see 
do not involve companies that are uh, insolvent or that are under uh, restructuring. But um, we should also say that uh, to some extent, maybe these uh, cross-border mobility transactions in Italy have been used uh, to avoid the application of insolvency law in Italy. And for this reason, uh, to some extent, uh, probably also the directive has uh, strict uh, uh, controls uh, now. Um, traditionally, the Italian law is quite open to these transactions, also in case of insolvency. Uh, what the other panelists uh, uh, said uh, made me wonder to what extent the creditor protections that are provided by the directive uh, uh, would coordinate uh, with the, the creditor protections you have in insolvency procedure. Uh, because you can say that, again, uh, if a court order authorizes the transaction, uh, would that be sufficient? Uh, would you still need to have uh, to ensure the existence of the same creditors protection you have uh, when uh, you are not in an insolvency procedure? Uh, I think these are problems that uh, we would need to address in Italy for sure, and that uh, are quite delicate. But uh, I would say that the situation now is quite uh, intricate because uh, we are uh, implementing now a new national legislation on insolvency. We have the European uh, legislation on restructuring, and we have uh, the new cross-border merger directive. So the, we have many pieces in the puzzle, uh, and uh, it will be difficult to fit them uh, together well. Yeah, thank you, Corrado. Uh, yeah, uh, there is uh, a very important link between the, the directive on cross-border mobility and the directive 2019-1023 on early corporate restructuring and second chance. And um, related to the insolvency proceeding, but in, uh, in a different uh, field, um, the question is related to Article 86A4A of the Directive on Cross-Border Mobility. This article establishes that the member states may decide not to apply the directive to companies which are subject, subject to preventive restructuring framework as defined by national law, irrespective of whether such proceedings are part of a national insolvency framework or regulated outside of it. And therefore, uh, we are talking now about a very different proceedings that the traditional judicial insolvency proceedings um, and the directive gives the option for member states to exclude companies under preventive restructuring framework of the scope of the directive on cross-border mobility. And, um, I would like to point out that the Directive on Early Corporate Structuring has introduced a new paradigm in dealing with the company's economic difficulties. This move away from traditional, formal, and judicial insolvency proceedings opens up a broad area to private ordering. And the key issue is facilitate contractual and quasi-contractual agreements restructuring agreements between distressed business and their creditors with no or very limited court involvement. And um, I don't know uh, uh, if the directive on early corporate structuring has been transposed into your country's national law. Uh, it is a, a question for Tim, for Jan, for Celine. Uh, in Spain, currently, the draft of the reform of the Spanish law in order to transpose the directive uh, on early corporate restructuring is in the parliament. And uh, we hope that surely during the first semester of 2022, the reform of the Spanish insolvency law will be passed. And um, well, mm, I think uh, it is important uh, to see the link between this directive and the directive on cross-border mobility and the decision uh, on the, on the um, exclude or not 
companies under preventive restructuring framework of the scope of the directive on cross-border mobility, in my opinion, is, is a, a key question. And I would like to know uh, the approach of the, the speakers in this round table. Tim, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I can be quite brief um, here because I do not have any knowledge of the fact that the Belgian legislator is transposing or transponing uh, Directive um, 2019 uh, 1023. Um, so, um, no, I don't really have any um, experience uh, or specific uh, points to add. In, in this regard, there was perhaps one other thing that I was thinking about uh, concerning um, question number three, which perhaps um, um, is interesting in, in, in light of uh, question number four, because we, of course, focused on the creditors uh, when we were talking about, uh, que in, about question number three. But the thing is, of course, that once a company is under a, a insolvency procedure and it got protection for a certain uh, debts, etc., uh, uh, against uh, uh, creditors. Um, I, I think that um, uh, because you also talked about uh, protection given by given by by a judge by court. So I think that I, as a notary, if a, um, um, a creditor comes to me and opposes himself to a cross-border division, for instance. Um, saying that, okay, I have, uh, there is a debt, et cetera, et cetera. But if I know that actually the debt doesn't really have any teeth, that it can't bite because of the fact that a judge protects, that in that case, I will have to be able of delivering my um, pre-demerger um, certificate in that case. So I think that this adds another extra layer to the discussion um, that we had on, under question number three, and um, the, where we enormously focused, and it was my fault because I was the one who introduced it, but where we enormously focused on the rights of the creditor. Um, so that um, as a um, answer to question four and going back to question three. Okay, uh, I agree, uh, Tim, and um, you are right, because uh, if we focus on the debtor, not only uh, on the creditor, the approach probably must be also different because as I have already mentioned, uh, uh, merger, divisions, um, probably I'm not sure about uh, cross-border conversions, but related to mergers, divisions, uh, it might be a very important restructuring tool and if you are under the umbrella of a judicial proceeding, and also you have the umbrella of the protection, the creditor's protection that comes from the directive on cross-border mobility, because there are specific uh, uh, instruments to protect the creditors in this directive, uh, probably, we our approach would be different, no? Because, well, maybe the key question is one fits all, or one solution in any case, or we must distinguish uh, which company is under a uh, judicial insolvency proceeding. Uh, I don't know, but uh, it is a, it's a very important question in order uh, to transpose the directive on cross-border mobility. And then um, related to the new restructuring uh, framework, I would like to know the approach uh, of Jan related to Czech. In the Czech Republic, the transposition, the transposition of the uh, directive on preventive restructuring is in preparation. And I suppose that uh, companies that are subject to preventive restructuring framework uh, will be allowed to participate in uh, cross-border mergers and uh, similar transactions. Uh, and I, I'm convinced that uh, they should be allowed because 
because this operation can be a very useful tool uh, to prevent bankruptcy and insolvency proceedings and can help do can help companies in economical difficulties. Yeah, uh, yeah I agree. I agree. Well, probably the problem is that in, in, in these uh, out of court workouts, the intervention of, of the judge is minimal, and sometimes there is no intervention in this. Uh, preventive restructuring framework and um, well probably might be a, a, a problem of protection of creditors but I agree with you I think um, well we are in a new paradigm and uh, merger divisions uh, are or might be a very important restructuring tools I don't know if a cross-border conversion might be a restructuring tool. I'm not sure about that. I, I, I don't know. But uh, if you want, we can go away. But uh, Celine, the floor is yours now. Alors, sur le, les travaux sur la, la transposition de la directive, euh, il y a, en France, il y a trois points qui sont ressortis. Euh, l'impératif de gagner de la vitesse, euh, donc un impératif de, de célérité pour un, une protection accrue, euh, alors avec notamment euh, l'instauration d'une sauvegarde pour 12 mois sans prolongation, euh, également un droit de communication accru. Alors, on avait déjà commencé euh, pendant la période Covid avec euh, un système euh, d'alerte précoce du commissaire aux comptes qu'on maintient, et euh, une procédure donc, euh, qui est enrichie de détection et prévention qui euh, figure dans notre code de commerce. Et euh, surtout, ce qui est important, c'est le, le droit au rebond, ou du moins à la deuxième chance, euh, avec éventuellement une procédure de remise de dette totale dans un délai de, de trois mois. Euh, donc, en France, on a la procédure de rétablissement professionnel, euh, qui permet euh, de donner euh, une deuxième chance. Euh, donc, on, enfin, pour ma part, je pense que la combinaison euh, des deux directives euh, peut être un outil euh, intéressant euh, dans le cadre des restructurations d'entreprise et euh, notamment euh, celle sur la restructuration et euh, les, la prévention des difficultés économiques, euh, évi euh, éviter d'arriver enfin, trop loin jusqu'à la liquidation et euh, d'aider les entreprises à, à, à rester dans, donc, dans les deux premières euh, procédures qui existent chez nous, c'est-à-dire la sauvegarde euh, et le redressement judiciaire. Merci, Céline. Je suis uh, yeah, in my opinion, the approach for those companies and their preventive corporate restructuring proceedings should be different than related to those which are under an insolvency proceeding. Uh, the situation is very different. Uh, on the one hand, because the companies under these restructuring proceedings are not yet in an insolvency situation, but rather likely insolvency. That entails that, at least at the first sight, the, the cross-border operation doesn't imply a special risk uh, for the creditors. And um, on the other hand, because uh, as I have already mentioned when I was talking with Yang, um, at least mergers, uh, divisions and acquisitions can be a very important way to restructuring companies and it is easier under the European legislation on cross-border insolvency than in any case implies uh, the application of the main center of interest, the so-called COVID, you know? And um, well, uh, uh, my personal opinion uh, is in favor to extend uh, the scope of the directive to companies under 
restructuring, preventive restructuring proceedings. But in our working group, we are considering whether to include or not the companies under preventive restructuring proceedings in the scope of the directive and the decision has not been taken yet. And uh, that's why for us, it is very important to, to know about your experience. Um, maybe, Conrado, you, would you like to add something? Or... Well, I, again, I'm not a really an insolvency law expert, uh, and uh, we are really at the center of, uh, I would say, uh, several uh, uh, implementations of directives and uh, uh, also national reforms of uh, restructuring and insolvency law. Um, so what I can say, and also our, uh, the works of our working group implementing uh, Directive uh, 2121 in Italy started quite recently. So we don't have a, a real answer to this. Uh, traditionally, what I can say is that Italy tends to be liberal. So, uh, then one thing is to say just that, another thing is to say what then will happen in practice, what we will do. I guess we will not exclude that possibility, but this is just an educated guess uh, in general. But then how it will be practically uh, arranged, uh, it will be mainly for the working group to decide and our working group uh, features also prominent uh, insolvency judges. So they for sure are uh, in a better position. One of them is attending today, by the way. So they're in a better position and I talk under his control. So they're in a better position uh, to, uh, I would say to address all the issues that may be related uh, to these procedures. Yeah. Because, uh, well, I'm sure uh, the year 2022 and 2023 will be the years of the preventive restructuring of companies because after the COVID economic crisis, restructuring will be very frequently and um, we are going to see uh, different situations in which the companies uh, will try to, to merge their division, cross-border division as a way to restructuring companies. Okay, if there is no questions in the chat, um, I don't know uh, if you have other suggestions so as to make our debate more interesting or something, maybe, uh, we can talk about the notion of legal personality in the context of cross-border uh, conversions so related to Paul Wood case, for instance, or something if you would like to comment about this question. Celine, maybe you would like to say something about the Notion of legal personality. Alors, sur la notion de personnalité morale, euh, en fait, euh, la modification, euh, pour moi, se trouve dans la droite ligne de la jurisprudence de la Cour de justice de l'Union européenne. Parce qu'on a deux, on, on se réfère à une personnalité et un transfert uniquement euh, du siège euh, juridique et non pas forcément du siège réel effectif euh, de la société. Euh, donc, euh, on a deux jurisprudences. On a la jurisprudence Vallée et Pitésie de 2012 et surtout la jurisprudence Paul Bout de 2017 euh, qui est sur ce point-là. Euh, donc, sur la jurisprudence Paul Boud, euh, c'était le transfert d'un siège statutaire, euh, donc une, une, une évolution libérale de la jurisprudence qui, euh, de la Cour qui va considérer que le transfert de siège sans déplacement du siège réel et sans en plus exercice d'une activité économique dans le nouvel État membre qui accueille ce siège relève de la liberté d'établissement. Donc, dans notre cas, on avait une, une société qui était établie en Pologne et les actionnaires ont voté le transfert du siège social au Luxembourg. 
euh, tout en maintenant euh, l'activité économique euh, en Pologne et la direction effective euh, des affaires de la société euh, sur place. Et euh, donc, ils ont soumis, euh, donc, après le transfert de siège, au droit luxembourgeois. Et euh, donc, il y a eu des, des conflits sur euh, la, la production de documents euh, et notamment euh, de documents comptables. Donc euh, là, euh, dans notre directive euh, 21-21, on retrouve cette notion euh, de transfert uniquement euh, du siège social au sens juridique et non pas du siège effectif de direction de la société, ni de centre de décision et euh, des activités économiques. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tim or Jan, would you like to add something? Um, perhaps very briefly again, um, one of the big innovations of our new company's code here in Belgium was the fact that, and that's what Celine also stated, was that um, as from um, May 1st, 2019, we use the um, Um, as a starting point, the, the statutory seat, and donc uh, le siège social, the statutory seat can be decided uh, freely by uh, by the company. So, um, um, which and, and that's something that we find very um, a, a very good um, evolution because before that, we uh, applied um, the regular we applied a rule that um, a company. Um, is uh, linked to where its most important economic activity is and where, or more um, specifically, the place where the most important decisions of the company were taken, okay? Um, which um, is, of course, very factual, whereas the, the, the rule where the statutory seat uh, organizes everything, so according to Polbut, um, is uh, much clearer and we feel uh, we are again very um, happy with uh, the fact that um, the Belgian legislation evolved um, in, uh, in, that, uh, in that way. And um, for instance, when we have uh, cross-border uh, conversions, etc., or when we used to have cross-border conversions, etc., with uh, the Netherlands, where the incorporation theory um, is applied, We, um, well, we used to have quite some um, um, problems of double nationality, etc. So we, we are very happy with um, this evolution in, uh, in Belgian uh, law. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jan, would you like to add something? Uh, this is no issue in the Republic because uh, uh, The Czech point of view is that the seat is uh, really formal and has nothing to do, corporate seat has nothing to do with uh, real center of management and, or business activities and uh, conversions are, are allowed in, in the Czech Republic. Thank you. Corrado, would you like to add something or? This yes, topic? with pleasure. Also because it is a topic that I, I really love, and I see Cosita smiling, because <laughs> we, we <laughs> talked about that in the past. And uh, my impression is that the very definition of cross-border conversion in the directive is really narrow. And it doesn't include uh, all cross-border mobility transactions. And in fact, uh, quite recently at the University of Luxembourg, they had a very interesting conference where they were discussing uh, private international law criteria applicable to companies. The benefit of uh, maintaining a real seat doctrine, contrary to what uh, Tim was saying, applying the Lamotte doctrine, which is a Belgian doctrine that says that if you're moving from England, uh, from the UK to Belgium, you can keep uh, both nationalities. And, uh, This is just a guess, but uh, um, since these transactions are not covered by the directive 2121, maybe you will see more of them yes. exactly because they are not subject to this type of yeah. burdens. Yeah, right. yeah. And uh, uh, to be frank, uh, I'm now carrying out an empirical research on that. <laughs> 
and I found many of them in many countries in, of the European Union and the many countries that you wouldn't expect to have these companies that are, I would say, having uh, cross-border mobility transactions that are not cross-border conversions. So beyond the Luxembourg and Belgium that traditionally applied the Islamot doctrine, you have Ireland, you have Germany, <laughs> and uh, I would say, and then you have other countries, uh, Hungary, for example. Uh, these are things that are not studied in scholarship and uh, you see in practice and uh, probably they would deserve more attention uh, also from an academic perspective. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, there is no any question in the chat. Therefore, um, I just can say thank you very much for your participation in this round table. It was very interesting. And um, if you agree, Colorado, we are going to continue with the second panel on the topic of uh, challenges and national approaches in the implementation of controls on the legality of the operations covered by the Directive on Cross-Border Mobility.